of September 2nd, 1945, found components of our Pacific fleet outside Tokyo Bay. The first ship to enter the bay was a signal ship whose signal corps personnel operated a kind of floating message center. They beamed to the world the now historic happenings aboard the USS Missouri. Let us pray that peace be now restored to the world and that God will preserve it always. These proceedings are closed. So World War II, the most terrible war mankind has ever known, was over. The courage and skill of our soldiers, sailors, and Marines had finally paid off. Like many others, we of the Signal Corps had come a long way to Tokyo. A long way from Fort Monmouth, where we had started. Started, of course, with training. First, we had to be molded into good soldiers. We'd be called upon to fight side by side with hard slugging infantry. Then we were trained as technicians. Training aids such as these helped plenty in the officer's radio course. At the beginning, we studied a variety of field sets. But these were only babies compared to ones we learned about in fixed radio, the long distance ones that could carry messages around the world. not the crank, but we finally got the hang of it. This particular set is for coastal defense. It's so sensitive that it does more than pick up the target. It picks up the splashes of shells as the salvo is fired. We learned what makes a signal center tick how to handle a constant stream of traffic by radio and wire, telephone and teletype. Teletype at 100 words a minute instead of 60. We learned to apply this knowledge in combat. Carrier equipment for tactical use was a most revolutionary development in communications. The telephone carrier equipment provides four telephone channels from either two or four physical circuits. When it's used with the telegraph carrier equipment, one of the telephone channels is used to provide six or 12 additional teletype or telegraph channels. As an example of how signal service worked, a messenger plane picked up a map in the field. It then landed not far from headquarters. The pilot handed over the map. Cleared through the message center, it was sent by facsimile to intelligence. From there, the information it contained reached the artillery. And the target designated on the map was smashed. Onto every beach we landed went units called Joint Assault Signal Companies. Joint because they were roughly one quarter Navy and three quarters Army personnel. Their first job to fight their way ashore. They carried carbines, machine guns, submachine guns, rocket launchers, rifles, automatic pistols. Their second job, to set up communications under enemy fire on the first piece of land they hit, to direct Navy artillery support, air support. Keep the commander in constant touch with his ground troops. As our infantry, armored and airborne divisions moved inland, followed by corps and army troops, the responsibility for communications within these units fell to their respective signal officers. Division signal companies and corps signal battalions took care of communications from regiment on up to corps. In many situations, speed in setting up communications is vital. Now, wire can be laid by plane. It's fast 
and a lead pipe cinch to do. This was a different story. Linking India to China by telephone and telegraph for the first time in history. The communications construction job was completed by Signal Corps troops of the India Burma Theater, June 11, 1945. Another first connected with the job was that it completed one of the longest spans of open wire over a river. The line didn't have long to serve the Far East in war, but it continues to function in peace. Behind the miles and miles of submarine cables laid down by the Signal Corps, behind all kinds of field army communications, within and between units of all types and sizes, was developed the most tremendous system of its kind ever conceived. The signal center in the Pentagon building was the heart of this great army communication system. Messages punched on tape traveled anywhere throughout the length and breadth of this new system without any change in form, going from wire to radio nets or radio nets to wire as needed. Through no necessity for change, much time was saved and errors avoided. Through this room, daily passed the plans in code that encompassed the world. On April 28, 1945, a new record for round-the-world transmission speed was established. The message, this is what God has wrought, Army Communications Service. The route, Washington, San Francisco, Manila, New Delhi, Asmara, and back to Washington. The distance, 23,200 air miles. The time, nine and one half seconds. Everyone, no doubt, has seen pictures of the first wave going ashore during amphibious operations. But how many have ever stopped to think about who took the pictures? Somebody had to be there to do it. Photographers of the Signal Corps Army Pictorial Service recorded the history of World War II on film, giving a play-by-play -play description. We furnished the material for a weekly staff film report of the war. Shot on the spot, the film was flown to the Signal Corps Photographic Center in New York. There it was assembled and edited before being shipped to the general staff and commanding generals in every theater of operations. We were also responsible for training films, estimated by the War Department to have cut down training periods by one third. Orientation pictures like Why We Fight told soldiers what the war was about and the nature of the enemy. The fighting men pictures told them what to expect of themselves and the enemy in combat. We also made foreign versions for our allies. Even up at the front, our films helped GIs sweat it out. Here's a foxhole theater showing one of the best releases. It's been a pleasure participate in this little song fest with you fellas. Now, far be it from the likes of me to tell the likes of you on which side to cook your eggs, but please be reminded. You got to accentuate the positive. Elim, but it's the negative. Latch on to the affirmative. Don't mess with Mr. In Between. Do you hear me? Don't mess with Mr. In Between. Accentuate the positive. That we did. And we couldn't mess with Mr. In-Between, especially in procurement. Our appropriation from the War Department in 1944 was over five and one half billion dollars. Big in any league. We procured and distributed over 1,000 separate items of signal communications equipment to all the other arms and services of our ground and air forces. Navy got a lot of it from us. And, of course, our lives. We developed and made changes in many types of signal equipment. 
reducing the size and weight while increasing the efficiency. We made vast strides in the study of electronics. A moisture-proof switchboard measuring 12 by 3 by 1 and 1 quarter inches and weighing only 1 and 1 quarter pounds. It's particularly useful in the jungle, where it may be strapped to a tree as a switching center for local battery telephone lines. In our laboratories, we employ some of the finest engineering brains in the world, both military and civilian, in peacetime as well as war. New developments in radar, color radio telephoto, and single sideband transmission for long-haul radio communications are some of the Signal Corps' contribution to the Army and world science. The results of long hours of planning and experimentation, hard work, but to a man with an engineering bent, fascinating because it's always looking to the future. Our campaign against Germany could never have moved so swiftly without the direct means of radio, telephone, and teletype communication furnished by frequency and pulse time modulated radio relay equipment. Radio relay is destined to play a large part in radio and telephone communications of the future. Radio relay didn't stop at just handling messages. The photograph of a much needed map through the use of facsimile could also be flashed from sender to receiver. The Army Air Forces used a new kind of radar which we adapted for them. This plane is lost. As it happens, it's lost on a training flight in this country. But what you will see can happen and has happened in combat. They're looking for Boston. The pilot switches on his radar. This is what he sees on his scope as the radar waves pierce the thick cloud layer and reflect back from the surface of the Earth. The radar trained man can read this as clearly as you can read this map. He knows that black spot is Boston Harbor and that he's directly over it. But that's how our bombers found their targets through the blackness of night or in any kind of weather. Speaking of weather, the long-range forecasts now made possible are attributable to different types of meteorological equipment developed by us. The clues to what the weather will be like next week are today thousands of miles away. Here's something else from our bag of tricks. Let's say an attack or invasion is being planned. We must know what the atmospheric conditions are going to be behind enemy lines. So an automatic weather station is dropped. It works on a principle called radio song. The station's timing mechanism is so set that within a few minutes of landing, it will send out the first weather observation. From then on, every three hours for a week or more, it will send out weather data in code, pressure, temperature, humidity, and station identification. As yet, it hasn't learned to cook. <laughs> 